Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to this workshop. I had you had a very nice lunch. Uh, this is usually one of the most challenging slots for workshops as people are now digesting, so we try to keep it lively and interactive as much as possible. Uh, my name is Andra Glorioso. I'm a policy officer of the European Commission at DG Employment, uh, Social Affairs and Inclusion, and I will be the moderator for this session. And I'm very, very glad to have uh, uh, both uh, here on stage uh, and connecting online uh, a stellar cast uh, of panelists, uh, uh, including uh, Mr. Maxine Ceruti, Director of Social Affairs uh, from Business Europe, uh, uh, Ms. Isabel Schoman, Deputy Secretary General of ETUC, Professor Marzia Mortati from the Politecnico Milano School of Design, Dr. Ravit Dotan, uh, Founder and CEO of Tech Better, and joining us online and perhaps uh, visible, uh, hopefully, uh, also to you, uh, Dr. Anne Mollen, a research assistant at the University of Münster and also an advisor for Algorithm Watch in Germany. Now, very briefly, the topic of today's workshop uh, is uh, about design. And we will hear in a moment about what that term actually means so that there is no misunderstanding uh, and the conversation can be on the same terms. But the bottom line and the reason why we would like to have this conversation is that very often, uh, the debate uh, about the use of algorithmic management, uh, including but not limited to artificial intelligence tools in the workplace, uh, is a debate that starts at the moment when those tools uh, are already in the workplace. And that is an important debate, and we heard uh, throughout the forum uh, how can it be done better or less better, what should be done more. But beyond that debate, there is also a question, uh, what do we do, should we do something before those tools are actually put into the workplace. And that's the question of the design of those tools. Uh, some of you who know perhaps a little bit better about other fields of European Union law are familiar with the terms of privacy by design or security by design. And those are existing concepts that basically suggest that certain principles have to be considered in the very early stage of thinking about the technology which then leads to the development of the technology and then leads to the implementation and operational use of the technology. So in this workshop, we would like to have a conversation about that very first early stage. Is it working well? Can we do better? What can we do better? Who should be involved in that conversation? And as I said, to have an informed debate and discussion about it, we first need to understand the terms. And so I would like to ask Professor Mortati Marzia, uh, if you could please guide us uh, uh, in uh, 10 minutes, uh, or uh, as much as possible within 10 minutes, uh, on uh, explaining to us uh, what is design. And uh, Professor Mortati has a slide presentation, which I would ask uh, uh, the team to put on the screen. Any time? I think we're getting there. Yes. Marcia, please, the floor is yours. So thanks, Andrea, for inviting me. And uh, very nice to see so many faces in the audience. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and to have these 10 minutes of chance to explain to all of you what is design, which is actually my area. Uh, of expertise uh, as a professor at Politecnico di Milano and to try and have this uh, uh, hopefully engaging conversation about how we can apply this approach and this process to the very interesting topics that we are discussing in these two days of event. So let me start with an analogy uh, that design is a different language. It is a different language in the same way that, uh, and it needs to be learned in the same way as we learn any new language. And therefore, as, as in the metaphor, any time that we try to learn a new language, we go through many difficulties. At first, we study the rules, the grammars, the sentences, the words, and at a certain point, we seem to be getting what it is to be speaking the new language. But then, as soon as we are ready to level up in our ambitions, and we try to move to the real place where the language is actually spoken daily, we soon discover that we need to start it all over again. 
But despite those difficulties, as soon as our brain has the time to master the new culture, the new language, the new habits, and gets around the new rules, we, something magically clicks in our minds, and we soon understand that we are suddenly capable of, uh, of doing, of talking uh, and understanding the, the people in front of us in new ways. So in the same way, uh, learning what is design uh, shows the same difficulties. But despite those difficulties, design is also a very interesting language to be using, and something that can give us a lot of advantages. I think the clicker works. Sorry about that. Seemed to work before. Okay. So let me start by underlining some of those advantages uh, that the design approach can bring to any, uh, to any process. Those advantages are in fact very much acknowledged nowadays in the literature, in the research, and for many different projects and use cases. For instance, design is acknowledged for being a form of innovation that can really guide us to address and solve unknown and complex problems. Design can help us knowingly to think laterally about the public issues and the challenges that we face nowadays, so to look at those issues from a different angle. And it can also help us put the perspective of humans at the center, really trying to start in the resolution of our challenges from the needs and the values of people, of the people that are going to benefit from the solution that we will deploy, and therefore really situating our actions, which I think are all points that are extremely relevant in the conversations that we are having nowadays on adopting AI in many different instances of our lives. So, uh, traditionally, however, when we think about design, we still have this uh, tendency of thinking about it as a very messy and post-it-based process that we don't really know where it's going to, uh, to get toward or what the output is going to be. However, this is not always uh, um, the reality. This is not always the truth, because design has also been studied and developed for a very long time as a much more structured process that has a certain number of principles. And first of all, it's an iterative process that is very much hinged not only on putting people's values first, but also on experimentation in real contexts. So the picture that you now see on the slide is just an example of one of the many representations of design as a structured process to facing problems. And of course, I don't have time and it's not even the right place to go into details of what this diagram is telling us. But what is relevant to highlight um, in this representation is that typically a design process starts from a challenge that needs to be understood in a context with involving early on, right away, in the process of problem framing, setting, and understanding the people uh, that uh, we're working for, and therefore that we will, work in, we will be working with as well. And then through fa different phases that also go through idea generation, it typically ends up with, uh, with the production of a solution, or, uh, and this solution can be a process, can be a service, can be a system, uh, and so on. So according to this process, we can highlight four main advantages of design. The first advantage is certainly human centricity. And this is a very important point that design holds very, very dear and very true. And how it does bring human centricity to our processes is that it always starts, as I already mentioned, from an in-depth understanding of the context, of the situation in which, in which the problem happens, and of the values uh, that people uh, have and hold as meaningful in their life. Uh, design does this also through the direct engagement of people and stakeholders through approaches and techniques that typically fall under the definition of co-design, uh, which helps bring human centricity to the process. Then to design also prototyping is very dear because as designers we do not develop uh, solutions in a vacuum, we do not understand problems in abstract, 
but we uh, try as much as possible to test directly with people again very early on in our process the solutions that we are envisaging. And this also brings as a central element in the design process experimentation that needs to happen in real context and again uh, with real people. So these principle are principles are very much hinged on one central notion that is very dear to design. And this says that the people that we design for, that we develop solutions for, are not only central to understanding a problem and therefore a situation and a context, but they are also central to developing a good solution or a solution that could really meet meaningfully the real life, the real experiences of these people. So in this sense, design uh, is very much a co-creation process uh, that uh, uh, involves at the same level both experts and non-experts in the design process, when, where the non-experts are typically those people uh, that bring, that experience the issue and for which we are designing for. So having gone through a little bit of uh, uh, some of the central notions that we uh, have in design, let's try and link uh, those elements that I, uh, that I presented you uh, with the topic that we are discussing here uh, in this event. So how can these principles really be applied to discussing AI adoption in the workplace? And in order to do that, I wanted to uh, pick your brain into, just for a minute, <laughs> trying to imagine, imagine a future situation. So imagine uh, a future in which a specific location in which uh, to carry out our jobs didn't exist anymore, in which we could freely work remotely wherever we wanted, managing our time according to our ambitions, according to our values, according to our culture, and so on. Wouldn't it be great, really, to manage our own time, our own objectives, uh, uh, just according to, really, to what we want to do? So let's imagine just for a second, wouldn't it be great? But then the next question, if we think about this possibility, is really at what cost? which means what are really the implications of imagining and realizing this future. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so fast forward to today, we all know and turns out that this possible future that I just described really is already our reality. Uh, but not exactly in the way we were imagining it when we chose to go for this type of future and when we chose to invest uh, our future in this type of free and remote working. Several drawbacks uh, are very present in, all, in, in our lives. Uh, and it is clear that the type of uh, freedom in the jobs that we do in our works is not really, um, is not really representing that type of, uh, of future that we were imagining, even when we include algorithms in this picture. To, include, uh, to increase productivity, effectiveness, and supposedly, and as we heard from many different talks in these two days, free time, our free time. But in any case, one thing that is clear in this present future that I just described is that algorithms are certainly not new in our society and are certainly not going to go away. They already permeate several aspects of our lives, from simpler applications like navigation systems to more heavy-duty tasks um, like medical diagnoses or applications in HR tools that can help humans uh, to make supposedly better decisions on who is going to get the job and who is not. Um, so, however, when we think about a new technology like AI, there is such an inherent complexity uh, in understanding these technologies that still many people, and here I'm really referring about uh, normal people, uh, let's say lay people in the street, do not really yet want to engage in understanding what AI means and do not yet ask all those very necessary questions because very often 
they might be scared of not understanding the technology and the complexity, or they might be scared of not, not asking uh, good questions or asking silly questions. But really, when we think about AI systems, uh, they are just like new products, and what we should be thinking about them is thinking about the, like, them like new products. So thinking, uh, let's think about buying a new electric appliance. When we buy it, don't we ask a lot of questions about the performance it has, the accuracy it has, and even how much energy it consumes, therefore trying to understand whether that product can really serve our purposes. And this is really what we should be asking as well about AI systems. Even more, if we think about AI like medicine, imagine that a new drug hits uh, the market. We would not be taking that drug and be putting that drug in our body without asking a lot of questions about it. And first of all, without knowing uh, the long-term and even the short-term consequences that taking this drug might have on our body. Uh, we've been asking a lot of questions. While it seems that with AI systems, it's a sort of a different story. And not many of us, not many common people are yet asking all of those questions. And we are yet not very sure about what the long-term consequences might be of the deployment, uh, the, the, the deployment of these AI systems will bring in our lives. And yet, they are already so much tangled in our lives. They play a role in so many different areas, in justice, in healthcare, in police, and so on. And this means that really what they are doing is that they are taking decisions about our lives, sometimes without us knowing how those decisions were really made. So, um, Considering this current landscape, what I would argue for is that we can certainly no, not go for a sort of techno-determinism embracing the idea that Prometheus will come and save us all. Uh, and this is why I think it is so important that more voices are involved into understanding what are these AI systems and what are the effects and the implications that they might have on our society and even how these systems mirror what we are as a society, also with our biases and contradictions. And here is, I would argue, also where adopting a design approach and a co-creation approach, uh, the one that I described earlier, can really come into play and can help. It not, it's not the only one. I would always argue for interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, but certainly design can have a say there. For instance, design has developed methods and tools to tackle uncertain and complex issues. It has done this for a very long time, starting from the 70s, uh, and has developed processes for understanding even the systemic nature uh, of those problems. And this is a first trait that certainly design can bring. But even more so, in today's complexity, very often, and I'm um, going to close shortly, uh, one of the most important things is not even uh, to, let's say, understand how to tackle a problem, but even before that is to understand what is the right problem that we need to tackle. And once again, here, design can provide very relevant elements to help us sense-make and sense-check that the issues that we are tackling are the right issues and that we are using the right tools for doing it. And then, as I was saying at the very beginning, finally, design is relevant because it can help us put humans' values back into our understanding of complex challenges and the applications of algorithms. And this is to conclude also, often also because when we think about science, we often think about it as a linear process that proceeds through discovery after discovery after discovery. But this is not really how reality goes. There are many branches that our decisions can take. And uh, uh, we really need to enlarge the discourse and the participation on who uh, take, has a say in deciding what these branches are. This might mean, for instance, imagining, reimagining or relearning what participation and co-creation mean, uh, not really uh, indulging too much in consultation, but really trying to listen actively 
and being ready for uncertainty, which is what co-creation participation really means. Uh, and what this might mean also is to change um, the way, the tools that we use for participation, helping us and the public in general to gain confidence about what AI systems are and how they can join this conversation. Because I would say, if you know how something works and you participated in developing how that solution is shaped, then you feel more confident using it. And you can also think about what it means for your future more knowingly. Thank you very much, Marcia. And uh, after this uh, forum, certainly, uh, a more conceptual presentation on the concept of design, I'd like uh, us to get a little bit more on the ground, if you will. And I'm very pleased that, that we could have uh, here on this panel uh, two representatives of the European Social Partners uh, from ETUCA, from Business Europe. And I would like now to turn uh, to them, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you agreed who is going to go first, so please, <laughs> you let me know how you would like to, to handle. Maybe ladies first, if that's okay with you. So, Ms. Schumann first. Uh, I, I would like really to, based on your experience uh, and, and uh, what you hear from, uh, from your members, uh, from, uh, from the people you're talking to, in terms of the reality on the ground, uh, uh, when we're talking about these systems, these AI systems, uh, does what Professor Mortati said resonate? Is there a real participation uh, in terms of thinking about these systems, uh, either on the workers uh, or on the management uh, side? Or if not, uh, is that an issue and how could we try to address mm -hmm. that issue? Yeah. Please, Ms. Schumann. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor first. Uh, thank you, uh, Max. <laughs> um, thank you for your invitation and, and exactly for, for this very important question. And thank you for Marcia to uh, shape the context uh, and, and coming back to some of the points. Uh, you said information is important, consultation not that much. I would say both are key in the whole process. And in particular for those who potentially are not the end user when it comes to the product itself, but have to bear the consequences of the use of AI at the workplace. And this is potentially the missing link uh, from the context to our discussions now. It, it's about the workplace, AI at the workplace. And of course, uh, the, 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 this conference is under, and there is a lovely pain saying, I love my social rights. And I'm totally with you on that. And then the panel is about co-design. And it's where, oops, that's already where the problem starts, because there is no co-design. Because we are not part of the whole process in terms of exactly the design, exactly where the terms of reference of a product, because AI is a product, the terms of reference are not set with the trade unions and workers' representatives exactly to prevent the bias, because they are biased, in a product, which is AI. So, of course, it is key to have a co-design exactly to make sure that in the design, in the implementations, and where a problem might occur, it can happen, that there is a possibility for the workers, their representative, and the trade union to be able to have a say. The whole problem that we also see here is that not only are we not part of the terms of reference, or the setting of the terms of reference, because we are not the end user, the end user being the employer, asking for AI to be uh, introduced at the workplace, we are not even there at the design itself uh, of AI, in particular AI product, because AI products are organized formed, uh, developed, within what we call standardization. So you won't see the development of, of an AI product within, I would say, the normal legislation. You will see in the standardization. Standardization is private, not setting by business for business. It's okay. But when that product has an impact on others, and here we speak about the workers at the workplace, so people are maybe uh, facing AI uh, all day long, at least eight hours a day, uh, during five days, um, you can understand that, that there, is, there is a missing link here. Um, on the top of that uh, is, of course, a product where there is a risk. And we know that the risk 
uh, might be immaterial because it's using your data, potentially without your consent, that is one dimension, um, is also um, a dimension where we do see that uh, there are tools that are monitoring you, that are there to control you in terms of a surveillance, to track you, where are you on the plant, and where um, there are also tools, and here we go a bit more in the, I would say, um, not so nice space of, of, of or remit of AI, where the whole business model is based on AI, is based also on potentially helping the employer, sometimes the worker, but most of the time the employer, to take a decision. And it is where we do see that some AI lead to hiring and firing without the intervention of the persons that should be in charge of this responsibility, which has an obligation to make sure that in the process of hiring, likewise in the process of firing, there is someone intervening, explaining to you uh, that the reasons why you are fired and giving also you the possibility to argue why you shouldn't be fired. We have situations, and I just give you a very blank one, we want to organize riders. Riders are the only tool they have with their bike that they usually have to, to pay themselves is, is the app where they get uh, they get uh, you know, the, the, the possibility to, 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 to have a, um, an order and, and to process this order. We have organized worker. We invited them to join us for five minutes in, in a place in Brussels to make sure that their working conditions are just decent ones, respecting the minimum ever, which is difficult for rider. From the day of that, within five minutes, they were disconnected. What does that mean for them? No, no one behind in particular, except the algorithm that says, oop, they are meeting there, and oops, in that same place there are trade unions, oop, in that same place there is a demonstration. And this has happened with us when we wanted to manifest for the working condition of riders. So, disconnected means no pay. Disconnecting me, no access to information, no possibility to prove that you've been doing so many rights uh, and that you uh, should own or uh, get, get uh, paid for so many rights. So here we have, we have an issue that has to be uh, regulated. AI can deliver as an innovation, and for that we, are, we agree. But it has to deliver for all, and not just for part of society, and this is the reasons why and I will finish that, we have identified in the AI regulation, the Draft AI Act, that the workplace is not addressed properly. Not only we have identified that, the Commission has identified that. The President of the Commission has identified this, leak, this, this lack of, of, of protection for the workers, because here we have a, a product which is linked with a very high risk when it comes to the social rights, the, the respect of the social rights. The European legislation says if there is a risk and you cannot protect, you have to apply the precautionary principle. And while you apply the precautionary principle, you can develop legislations to protect the potential people affected here, the workers, by AI. And this is the reasons why uh, Ursula von der Leyen at the TUC Congress in Berlin this year recognizes this loophole has confirmed that uh, uh, AI at the workplace will be addressed by the Commission by DG Employment because this is exactly the loop, the, the, the gap that we have to, to close now. Thank you, Ms. Schumann. And uh, before I give the floor to Mr. Ceruti, just very briefly, if you could, just to make sure that we all understand, do you think, uh, given this scenario, these this real issues that you have, uh, that you have shared with us, can I ask if you, if it you see, believes that an earlier intervention in the design of the technology that we're talking about could help addressing at least some of these issues that you have raised? If you could give a brief uh, response to that. Of course, of course, but the designer will work on the basis of the request he gets or she gets. Clearly, he's producing a product for a buyer, mm -hmm. and this person wants to have certain element. No, you have to make sure that in the development of a product that might 
impact negatively human rights and workers' rights are human rights in terms of more discrimination, in terms of bias because you're a woman and you will see through uh, the, the, the reading by AI, uh, the algorithm of your cover letter when you would like to apply for a job, that you are using certain terms that men will not use, that there are certain names uh, or your, your, your family names that may give an indication of where you come from. All of that can be part of the bias and the discriminations. If you have not terms of reference, where you have, where you have not the possibility for an ethical control of the product, and that cannot happen through standardization, clearly not, uh, this product will still be a uh, danger and will still drive discriminations where there should not be any. The same for your privacy. privacy. When do you have the possibility to give your consent? When you know that on your computer you have uh, an algorithm that track your eyes, that surveil you. And we had this case where a worker had to go to court because it will, he was asked to have his camera eight hours long on. That's not okay. And we know why. Because via the camera, you are tracked. You are, we had colleagues who had to wear armbands with with here the possibility to track them where they were. It's not okay if you cannot be informed if you are not consulted, if you don't have the guarantee that all those data that are processed stay within the company, are not sold somewhere else, are not abused, that the cyber security is, is an additional tool. So it's privacy, it's, it's fundamental <coughs> workers' rights, it's non-discrimination. So I think here we need to, to be on board, but it's not just a ticking box exercise. Absolutely. The human yeah. should be here to be able to take the final decisions and to be able to control. We hear you loud and clear. And uh, Mr. Ceruti, would you have, uh, would you like to, I'm sure you would like to add something. <laughs> Please go Andrea ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. And uh, Isabel, nice to see you here. And I think it's good that we have the opportunity to exchange in a panel like this on, on issues that are important for, for both employers and workers. Um, but perhaps to start with, to, to put the context, uh, Business Europe is an employer's uh, organization, but we're also, of course, a a business uh, federation and to recall to all of us that we are in a global situation where investments in AI um, are going faster in other uh, countries, advanced economies in the world. And um, all our debates, um, of course, are important ones to have. But I think the important uh, priority for all of us is to create the necessary conditions for investments by the companies in AI avoiding excessive regulatory burdens on the companies, making sure that we have in our priorities for EU policy making going forward competitiveness uh, as a key item. Um, and I know it's not what we are supposed to discuss here, but I want to flag it uh, as a first thing, because I think um, what we do should not be in contradiction to this objective, but supportive of this objective of having a competitive uh, European business that is able to provide good jobs and good working conditions for people. Um, when it comes to, to, to the topics that, that we are discussing, of course, um, we are looking into the dynamics um, across Europe and how different companies are addressing the issue of um, updating their technologies and improving the work processes um, so that uh, the, the best can be done with AI technologies. Um, I think we know all of us that the, the number of companies uh, that are actually using AI is not that huge at this point in time, so it is an evolving reality. And of course, it's important that we leave the space and we leave the time to the companies to have their own solutions um, and that the regulatory approach on the European level and in the member states is going to be leaving this space. Um, and that, I think, is important in terms of sequencing things in the right way. Um, but there is, of course, in the broader picture, I think already today we can see that there is a lot of good ideas that come from the workers. Um, and so we want to be innovative, we want to improve the way work is organized, we want to improve the way working conditions are, we want to improve productivity at work. And that, I think, is really a, a combined agenda of the social partners. Um, um, of course, we are also acting in an area where we have been operating through our agreements. Um, and as Isabel knows, we are just in the middle of implementing the European Autonomous Agreement on Digitalization. 
Um, this is an agreement that includes um, a specific chapter dealing with AI-related issues. It's from 2020, so of course, the new technologies, uh, generative AI, are coming in, and we need to take that into account. But I think we have good space to, to discuss it among social partners, to look at the trends. And of course, it would be great if we would have European companies that are in the, the league uh, that is leading on these uh, new technologies. Um, and so, for example, I think it goes in the right way that we see some countries like Germany investing and having a strategy for investments in AI. Um, companies like Aleph Alpha that are potentially going to be there on the market and providing some European solutions to this is, is of course, um, good news. Um, and, um, and the fact that uh, we are looking at it as social partners, I think, is, is something that is part of our DNA in Europe. We want to be investing um, in the social dialogue, in making sure that we find solutions and that we build the trust between the employers and the workers. Um, so, so this is the way we act as Business Europe. Um, on the other end, I think there are some issues that need to be um, looked at um, to understand well what is legitimate on the employer side and what is also something to be taken into account uh, from the worker side. And I mean, the fact that employers are using the technology to improve productivity and to include some controlling of the, the work that is done by the workers, I think is legitimate to the extent that it is known and that it is done, uh, of course, in accordance with um, the collective bargaining practices and, and in line with the information and, and, and consultation regimes. Um, we all know that there is a, the pending debate on the AI Act. Um, it's not a social legislation, so that, that's the first thing. And I know that there are uh, different views between the European Parliament and the Council on how to frame um, this information. And, uh, and that is something that we follow. But I think um, we also have the, the social debates. So there is uh, an upcoming proposal from the European Commission on European Works Councils, where we have proposed to negotiate uh, this revision to the trade unions. Um, and we regret but respect uh, the fact that they have decided not to negotiate it with us. Um, on the other hand, of course, we also know that um, ETUC has a priority um, to have a, a new legislation on information consultation and participation of workers, um, which we think is already well covered with the existing 2002 Directive on Information and Consultation of Workers at the national level, which of course needs to be used in a way that reflects well the, the changing dynamics and realities on the labor markets. So we understand that uh, it's important um, that the worker is involved um, to a good extent in the process of this innovation happening in the, the work organization. Um, but on the other hand, of course, it's also clear that human in control is something we support. Um, when it comes to recruitment and HR, um, I think uh, the problem is that everything is being classified as high risk. Um, and we need to be a bit more subtle in the analysis of what is high risk, what is not high risk, and where AI technology can validly help um, in the HR function. Um, likewise, of course, uh, we don't think that uh, those tools should be creating a bias or leading into discrimination. So it's, of course, very important to avoid that and to be sure that our rules are respected in terms of non-discrimination on, on the, the, the workplace and, and the recruitments. Um, having said all this, I think that uh, we need to be making the best of the AI technology. The very positive message I heard from Isabel is that the trade unions uh, see benefits in, in going forward with the technology. And on our side, we are willing to cooperate in the best possible way between social partners to make the best of it. And of course, uh, we will be following the legislative debates, being aware that uh, these debates are going to be taken forward by the Commission. And um, with this, uh, also to all those who are participating, I think we need to make a big difference between different uh, practices of industrial relations in the member states. We all know that some countries do it in, in, in a rather um, different way than others when it comes to participation, and it's important to respect the diversity of industrial relations systems and practices across Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxime. Uh, Mr. Ceruti, sorry, <laughs> and Ms. Schoeman. Uh, this was, uh, of course, a very important uh, uh, overview of what are sometimes complex debates uh, between social partners, which are, however, part and parcel. They're a very important element uh, of our European Union system inscribed uh, in the treaties. And so, of course, uh, any discussion on uh, 
any discussion on uh, design or co-design, uh, any decision, if ever, it has to be done within that framework, within that treaty-based framework, which recognizes a specific role to the social partners. This is obviously very, very important to keep in mind. Now, I would like uh, to move on uh, to uh, address uh, our online participants. Uh, sadly, she should have been an on-site participant, but we are still, we are nonetheless very happy that uh, Anne Mollen uh, could join us. Uh, and uh, I would like, uh, Anne, if you could uh, uh, briefly, 10 minutes, give or take, uh, give us a little bit your sense uh, based both on your current research and also on your uh, previous uh, experience and also your current advisory role, uh, in Algorithm Watch, uh, what is reality on the ground for workers? What is the use of these tools? Uh, we heard about uh, participation, about information, about transparency, and I think we all agree that these are important principles. Uh, is it happening? I is it actually the case? Do we have gaps there? So please, Anne, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Also, thank you so much for being able to join online. Um, to your question, no, it's not happening on the grounds, um, co-participation or co-design of algorithm uh, in the workplace, at least not in a sense as we have proposed. And we have lost sound. Uh, sorry, Anne, go ahead. Go ahead. We lost you for a okay, moment. Okay, sorry. Um, at least um, not in the sense that we proposed in a, in a research project that we conducted at Algorithm Watch, which is a civil society organization based in Berlin, working on algorithmic decision making and societal impacts they have. And we conducted a study for the German Hans Böckler Stiftung on worker participation along the machine learning pipeline. Because what these automated systems are usually based on, or especially where they become problematic, is machine learning. So um, what we pro proposed is that we need to have a conceptual shift in our discussion of workplace algorithms. And we're really speaking about algorithmic management in that sense, so that um, automated tools become implemented to exercise typical HR related tasks. So it's really a machine learning system targeting decisions about the workforce, about employees. And we, we conceptualized the need for a shift from risk mitigation, which we are discussing a lot, especially in relation to the AI Act, to worker participation and the ability of workers to implement their interests in the design of um, algorithmic management software. So um, the machine learning pipeline is a concept uh, quite usually applied in machine learning practice, but also research. And it basically divides up the machine learning lifecycle into different stages. So you can have the problem definition phase, you can have the data and data management phase, the model training, development and training, the deployment phase, and then the retraining phase. And we are arguing that worker interests need to be implemented from the start already in the first planning stages until the application and ev evaluation. Because in the problem definition phase, there are essential decisions taking um, and essential consequences for how it will affect workers. So they need to be involved when the question is asked what problem should be solved and how. They also need to be involved when it's discussed what data are being used and how are these data to be interpreted. And also in the model training. This is a stage where experts also need to be um, included, like machine learning expert, but also the people affected. They can have a say in the best methods that need to um, that should be applied to achieve the defined goals, and also they need to have a voice in when the when the models are then used in operation and when quality assurance and evaluation standards are in place. So um, this is really a conceptual shift, but it is so far a purely theoretical argument, so it's not really happening in practice. But it came out of the discussion and a re another research project that we did for the International Trade Union Confederation that we are stuck, or unions are kind of stuck in the discussions of principles, how to deal with AI in the workplace. And this is the attempt to move from principles to practice. Um, and it also is a discussion that provides a conceptual shift beyond the discussion of bias and discrimination. This is essential, but bias and discrimination is oftentimes a purely technical problem. But we have a much wider problem scape here because there are also a lot of organizational questions and questions of long term power shifts when we talk about automation in the workplace. So. Um, 
just to give you an example about the problem definition phase, because often it's also not even included in uh, discussions of the machine learning um, pipeline. But if you take, for example, an automated tool for internal hiring processes and for the internal job market, um, with an automated system, knowledge about organizational procedures is being internalized and to some extent made invisible in this program. And this leads to a lack of knowledge on organizational processes and also a lack of oversight, but also a lack of negotiating power for worker representatives. And it's also um, a lack of ability for the individual worker to self-assess one's options and abilities in this wider organization. So we, in the planning stage, in the first stage of defining what problems should an automated system solve, these long-term power shifts in organizational procedures already have to be recognized. And um, when once the automated systems are applied, these decision-making processes might render, might become invisible. And this lack of knowledge just weakens worker interests and undermines also long established organizational structures of worker representation, participation and co-determination. And I think this is something that has not been recognized enough. The long-term consequences automation in the workplace has on structures of worker representation. So what we have done um, in another, or this was our sister organization, Algorithm Watch Switzerland, they are currently conducting a research project with Swiss Union Syndicum. And um, they have conducted interviews with HR personnel and Swiss companies. And it it reflects very well what, what Ms. Schirman said before, that if workers are to be involved or employees are to be involved in these processes, it's it's very much in this end user logic. So, you know, it's mostly with HR personnel then, and they are being asked about um, how about the functionalities of uh, design software. You know, it's about the interface, for example, or how to integrate it into working life. But it's not about the people being affected, and it's not about the people whose data are being processed. So it's more about testing functionalities than about implementer worker interest in the automated decision-making process. And this is what has to be done. What, what's the obstacle here? Um, I think the obstacles are transparency, qualification, and opportunities in that sense, organizational structures that would allow for such worker participation. This is missing so far. We are currently developing or Algorithm Watch Switzerland is currently developing a qualification concept with Swiss Union Syndicum exactly to, um, to provide the necessary skills to worker representatives to be able to be involved in this kind of decision making along the machine learning pipelines. Um, but to come back to the obstacles more systematically, I think we have to identify three obstacles. One is that the scenario we have been sketching about worker participation is that software is being developed internally in an organization. And this is often not the case. Often it is the case that some external provider um, is providing the software and um, it's some ready-made product which can be applied. Um, but it's not um, the, the software development from scratch. So it, trade secrets become a problem here and lack of transparency because of trade secrets become a problem here because it is not clear what the systems really do. And this is also true for the employer side, by the way. Lack of acknowledgement um, that risk mitigation is the is not the only approach, it's the second part. So we really need to come to this understanding that risk mitigation um, cannot be the only solution to this problem. And third, lack of procedural frameworks to allow for worker participation is a third obstacle. We lack good practices in that regard, and we lack possibilities of consultation of external experts as well. Because um, I do think that we need external experts on the machine learning side in some stages of the life cycle, but I don't see the argument as holding up very well that workers uh, who are not experts in machine learning do not have something to say with regards how their data are going to be used. They have strong interests, even if they're not machine learning experts, and they should be consulted. 
I think this is also important for the employer side because we see a huge distrust in automated systems among workers. And these kind of processes, these kind of systems, they can allow to have worker representatives involved. And this can eventually lead to more trust in these systems because it's not only putting a label on it as being safe or being trustworthy, but it's really a process of implementing worker interests. And this is about transparency and communication about what these systems do. So I think in the long run, it really is also in the interests of employees. Uh, employers, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. And uh, um, you, you did refer multiple times to a keyword, of course, which is about skills and competencies. Uh, all workers, uh, I would argue also of, of managers, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, employers, uh, because uh, given what we know so far, I think there is a certain need for upskilling also from on that side, not that it, that's an obligation uh, of the unions, of course. But all I'm trying to say is that uh, this issue, this, uh, this, this need uh, for uh, understanding what we're talking about, for having the right skills to participate, uh, seems to be a shared uh, challenge, at least to us. Um, now, let's, uh, you, you also talked, Anne, about the long-term uh, effects uh, of, uh, of the issues that we're discussing here. And this allows me to uh, very well, actually, slide, and it was not planned, uh, but it allows me very well to slide uh, to our uh, next uh, and, uh, and final speakers uh, before we turn to some Q&A with the public, uh, uh, Ravit Dotan. Now, Ravit, uh, uh, we are hearing about uh, the long term and the fact that uh, when you're having with a comp, especially with companies, with businesses, uh, discussions about these technologies, there is always a tension between what is the short term immediate gain, but also what are the long-term implications. And there is always this tension between what can be done with technology and what should be done with technology, even from the point of view of the interest of the business. And these are discussions, strategic discussions, that are often held at board or C-level in companies, sometimes but not always, or yeah, not always with the involvement of workers. Now, given your, uh, your experience uh, with a company that your country CEO, your consulting, uh, you consult often with C-level and board-level companies, uh, what, do you think, what do you think is the best way to have these sort of conversations uh, about this technology and their impact, uh, and especially the long-term strategic impacts uh, of these technologies? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, and, and thank you for, for having me. Um, there are two points I want to make. Um, I'll start with going back to the comment about regulation. I'll use that as a, as a starting point. Uh, why do people come up with regulation about AI? It's probably because they're hoping to motivate companies to do certain things. And I think in the conversation about regulation, people sometimes forget the other kinds of motivations that exist out there. So I wanna focus on another kind of motivation, incentives, um, business incentives. I think that a lot of, many efforts to, uh, going back to the last speaker, many efforts to move from principles to practice or from talk to action, I think often they fail because people think about AI responsibility or AI ethics as a kind of a side project, something to aspire to, something that is nice to have when we get to it one day, and or when we're forced to by regulation. That is an approach that makes it really, really difficult because it separates AI responsibility from the core business model of the company, which makes it even the company, even if the company has the best of intentions, it's, it's going to fall by the wayside whenever something urgent comes up and something urgent always comes up. And so I think when it comes to the board level, C-suite level, what I would like to see them do is first and foremost understand how AI responsibility fits into their business model, because it does, because it does influence them. And so their first goal is to articulate how exactly that happens. That includes um, algorithmic tools they use to manage their own workforce, but, but not only, any AI that they might deploy or develop. That is, that is the first thing that I, that, I, that I think would be very, very helpful for them to do. Here are some thoughts about how AI responsibility might be a part of their of their 
business offering. Um, one is when you design AI responsibly, your product is probably going to be better because what does it mean to design a product responsibly when it comes to AI? Um, it can include input from whoever is impacted, including your employees. So going back to including people in the, in the design perspective, right? Um, it's just going to mean that your tool is going to work better. Whatever that tool is, if that tool is managing your workforce, then your workforce is just going to work better. So thinking of AI responsibility just bears very directly on the quality of the product that they're going to put out there. Um, second, when it comes to workforce satisfaction, so we're seeing many surveys indicating that employees in all age groups actually really value what they perceive to be ethical leadership or an ethical company. So millennials, right, the younger generation, they have a reputation for caring about those things, but actually surveys show that it's true for all age groups. So also AI responsibility impacts the, you know, the, the business model when it comes to talent acquisition. Um, and talent retention. So these are just a couple of examples, but I really recommend to, you know, boards, C-level executives to take this seriously and, you know, take time, figure out how it intersects with the business model, um, both in the short term and in the long term. The answer is going to be different for each company, but I can't imagine a company that's not going to have an impact on its business model. Um, th the answers are going to differ. Um, also, on this question of short-term versus long-term, um, a lot of people think that they, they can conflict, right? Especially when we hear about what is called existential risk or long-termism versus what people call near-termism. I don't really buy into the distinction that much because when you think about the risks that are called long-term and the risks that are called near-term, actually the mitigation strategies are pretty similar. So at the end of the day, you need to be responsible when you develop the tools, right? Um, if you're worried about AI systems kind of, you know, being too autonomous or something, well, the answer is human oversight. And that is also the answer to some of the near-term problems. So to me, the kind of collapse into one, and that one is, what are we actually doing right now? Um, and how are we going to create incentives to do those things right now? We're going to create them, among other things, by incorporating those practices into our, into our business model, and understanding how it impacts our company financially, in addition to how it you know, correlates to our business values. So that's one point, or like several points I wanted to make, but I, I, I also wanted to um, press on additional accountability mechanisms that we might lean into um, in addition to or in lieu of regulation. It's great to say to, you know, the, the C-suite or the board, you have to think of the business model, um, but how, you know, how will we create accountability for them to do that? Um, so I propose thinking from the financial perspective as well, uh, right? And I'm already hearing some investors doing that when we think of shareholders and what they can do and the kind of questions that they can bring to the board um, and the kind of answers that they can demand. They're actually in a position to demand questions about those, to demand answers to those questions. You know, how does it impact the business um, of the company? Um, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Great. Okay. So uh, the last point I want to make is about measurements. So the, the, the first point that I would want answers from, answers about from a company is, tell me how, tell me, show me that you've thought about how AI responsibility issues impact your business model and your revenue. So show me that you've thought of it. Um, show me, show me which aspects of AI ethics are especially impactful to your company. Is it human oversight? Is it fairness? What is it? And how? It, tell me numerically. Like, how does it? Show me that you've thought of this. But the second thing is, um, show me what you've measured. I think when it comes to accountability, measurement can be really, really powerful. So suppose a company claims in its AI ethics principles on its website that they really care about fairness. Like fairness, super important. Uh, suppose they say that, right? A lot of companies say that. The next thing to ask them is, great, show me what you measure about fairness. Because when you sh when, 
if they don't measure anything about fairness, the chances that they're doing anything about it are really small. Um, also, if, if they do measure, you can learn a lot by what they measure. When you say fairness, who counts? Is it gender? Is it race? Which genders? Which races? Um, and what exactly do you quantify as being fair? Um, I think that pressing companies, uh, it could be by regulation, it could be with financial incentives, <laughs> but pressing them on those questions can really help push them to that implementation um, that will get us both near-term and long-term better outcomes. Thank you very much, Ravita. I heard some uh, really interesting keywords in your intervention, uh, including uh, uh, the possibility to use non-regulatory instruments uh, to intervene. And this might surprise some people, but that's actually something that the European Commission always does. We, don't always, we do not always go for regulation as the first choice, but we know that there are different tools on the menu if there is a problem, and it should be the same for all the players uh, out there, although regulation is necessary in some cases, of course. Uh, the importance of understanding the incentives uh, and the importance to measure things, and I think that's really a shared uh, concern and a shared goal for everybody on this, pan on this panel, from academia to the social partners to the commission to business advisors. We need data, we need to measure things. Uh, now, I would like to open up both the physical floor here and also the online floor through Slido, and uh, I'm also looking at my colleague Mario to see if he's uh, already filtering a little bit, not filtering, sorry, we're not censoring anything, eh? but if you are having a look at the questions that are coming uh, through Slido. But as, we, as those questions come online, may I ask if there is uh, anybody who has a question, and I underline a question, not an intervention, a question from the floor. Yes, please, there is a person there. We, we will share a little bit because we also want to give the opportunity to people online to intervene. But first, please introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and ask your question. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Liva. I work at the European AI and Society Fund. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions. Really interesting. My question is to Isabel. Uh, about uh, the next, what, what should happen next in, in the workplace algorithmic management in terms of legislation? You identified that there are gaps in the AI Act. Um, what's your take? There's going to be a new commission soon. What, what should happen? Thank you. Please uh, uh, react. I would ask you briefly, if you can. Thank you. Sure, sure. Th thanks for the questions. I cannot preempt what the commission will say. That's for sure. But Thank I you. can give some ideas. <laughs> um, so, so, so we have identified already quite, quite a long time ago uh, these loopholes between AI and uh, the workplace. As I mentioned, the TUC has already a position. What we want to have, and this is, it is not possible given and exactly what uh, Maxim mentioned, we have not the right legal base. Uh, interesting enough, this is, this is the obstacle. We need to have a legal base by which exactly what was or what is the core of the discussions uh, those days is to have a, a possibility to co-design, to co-implement, to co-monitor, and at the end of the day, to see whether this AI uh, algorithm is working for both the employers and the workers, and not just for one of them. And usually we know the one that has to implement it without being able to say anything. And I think exactly what we are looking for uh, is that the existing, so we don't reinvent the wheel, the existing right of information consultations of the workers' representative and trade unions at the workplace are respected exactly when it comes to AI, because AI at the workplace is a source of change of the working conditions. And this is exactly the anticipation of change, which is part of the European legislation, social legislation, is exactly where AI comes in. And this is what we need to have in the legislation so that not someone out there can say, oops, I forgot that also the uh, social legislation in, in Europe applies to my AI product. So we have to make the link and we have to, be, to make sure that AI product developed in a private norm setting frame, which is standardizations, get out of that. Because here, the one we need to have on board, in particular the trade unions, are not part of the whole picture when it comes to have a say. And I think this is the same at the European level, it's a bit better at the European level, but at the international you can forget it. So I think here 
it is very important that we bring these discussions whereby, here again, innovation should deliver for all, and we believe in that, but on a democratic basis when it comes to taking the right decisions and bringing, involving uh, all of the important actors, and here again, workers are constituencies of businesses. They should have a say in that dimension. Thank you very much, and indeed, without prejudging the decisions of the European Commission, we take good note of these uh, <laughs> observations. I would now like to, uh, to go to one, uh, the, the top slide of question. Uh, I don't know if people in the room can see it, but I can see it in the screen here. So the question is, uh, do social partners uh, on both sides uh, have currently the necessary understanding of the technicalities of our algorithms uh, to allow effective co-design? Now, that is a question that is, of course, primarily directed uh, at the social partners on stage, but I will take the prerogative of the moderator to uh, slightly add to that question. Uh, and I think what's interesting to ask is also to what level is a technical understanding necessary in order to allow co-design. But let's first answer the question that is on Slido. And uh, if you don't mind, Mishoma, since you started first at the beginning, mm -hmm. I will let Maxime and Mr. Ruti start. So please, if you want to react, uh, and then we get the floor to you, see. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's an interesting question, and um, I'll try to answer based on, on what we do already with our agreement on digitalization. There is a key word in our agreement on digitalization, which is tailoring. So I think we are in this phase where the technology is developing. And of course, there will be many applications of this technology. And so on the one side, you've got the companies that are creating the technology. And those companies, of course, need to be sure that what they do is going to be helping developing uh, our productivity and, and, of course, reaching to their clients. Who are going to be their main clients? The main clients will be other companies that are going to buy these products. Um, and so they will need to serve the needs of their clients uh, who are going to buy in the technology they, they have developed and created. And, and that's where I think this workplace element comes into play because all the other uh, companies that are clients of the technology, they will want to make sure that uh, this is going to support the way they produce, the way they work, the way they organize work. Um, and there, I think, at this level of the tailoring, having a social partners approach means to work together to look into opportunities and risks relating to, um, to, to, to the new technologies together in a consistent way. Depending on the countries, depending on the approaches, there may be differences of approach, which need to be respected, as I explained before. Um, but then there is the, the last phase, which is about how the technology is concretely used by the workers. And that is relating to skills. And it is about ensuring that the people in the companies are going to be provided with the opportunities to upskill and reskill, but at the same time to make sure that there is a sense of individual responsibility by the workers themselves in developing and being able to use these technologies. Otherwise, they are going to lose their employability and their jobs and their capacity to do the jobs will become at risk. And I think it's also part of this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Nishoma, would you like to react as well? And But then I would also like the other panelists to offer their views on this, please. Sure, sure in a nutshell, I think, uh, and I have uh, my colleagues with me on board, who is the expert on that, Aida Ponce from the European Trade Union Institute, has developed what we uh, need to have as workers' representative and worker and trade union is, of course, AI literacy. and, and this is, this is uh, exactly where we appropriate what is, uh, what is AI, what is the concept, what is uh, what we need in terms of ethical uh, dimensions, but also, and if we don't get, and we can't get uh, in, into the, the, the very detail, then we have to have the expertise uh, brought from, from the outside, so we have to have the possibility to have re recourse to experts, and of course we have also to have the resources to do that. Uh, but clearly here one element which is, uh, uh, in the whole discussion, in particular for the trade unions, uh, in discussions with the employers, is to be able to have a say and to have a critical uh, uh, thinking about those tools uh, implemented uh, at the workplace, and in particular not just implementation here again, we have to be involved from scratch because when the tool has been designed and uh, has been developed and has to be implemented, it's already too late to ask us whether it's okay or not. 
Thank you. Actually, I would like to ask Professor Mortati, Marcia, based on your experience, uh, uh, you have a very broad experience in the design processes, uh, including uh, one thing that I didn't say is that Professor Mortati is also the deputy director of a master on artificial intelligence for public services, so she's specifically expert on how to apply design to artificial intelligence. But how important it is the technical knowledge in the design process? Because this is an argument we hear very often also inside the Commission, even as a criticism to the Commission. You can't possibly regulate this because you don't have the expertise to understand what is going on. And I've been 15 years in the Commission and I heard that argument a lot, and I think sometimes it's a little bit, uh, let's say, a biased argument. But in your experience, uh, how important it is to understand the nitty-gritty details, if you will, or what we are trying to design or co-design? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I was actually wanting to ask you to intervene exactly on this uh, while the others were replying. So I think that for me in this context, uh, technicalities or really the deep understanding of the technical issues is not really the point. Um, I think the point is really understanding, as I was saying earlier, what is the problematic situation that we are trying to address, or what is the uh, existing situation that we are trying to improve, and then understand what is the experience of the people that need to be involved of the situation. That is really, I think, an interesting starting point, and that is where the design process starts, really. And, uh, that's why problem framing or problem understanding and setting is so important. And that's where I would argue the participation should start. That's, that's the real criticality. And for me, one important element that is emerging from all of this conversation is that it seems that we more or less know the what, so we know you know, what AI systems, what principles, and so on. But there, there is another very important conversation that we should be having that is about the how. How do we apply those principles, for instance? We hear a lot about, uh, you know, avoiding discrimination, privacy, and many, many others. But really, for me, another very important conversation that we should have more is the how. How do we really apply those principles? How do we make those, this paradigm shift that we were talking about from risk mitigation to worker participation? The how is really the critical issue that maybe we are exploring a little bit less in our practices today and that maybe is a little bit more difficult to be implemented. Yes, the how is always a very difficult question, uh, isn't it? Uh, I think there was another question in the room indeed, uh, so if I can ask uh, to please introduce yourself uh, and keep your question very brief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah. I work for Eurocities. And I had a question for Dr. Uh, Mullen, but also for Professor Mortetti. Um, so my question is, according to you, and how do you conceptualize the best way to institutionalize this co-design process in a way that would follow the life course of um, you know, these algorithmic management processes? How do you envision it? How would it look like concretely? And how do you think that this could be potentially applied to other sectors, not only the workplace, but other sectors in which AI is being used? I'm thinking, for example, of policing. I'm thinking of healthcare. I'm thinking also of taxes. And all of these different ways in which AI has been used without directly involving people that are most affected by these decisions. Thank you. Fantastic question. Also briefly to the point. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I would ask uh, Dr. Moll and Anne to respond first. Uh, uh, and then we see how much time we have, uh, and uh, Professor Mortati can, if necessary, uh, complement. But Anna, please. Yes, thank you for the great question. Um, I cannot provide a one-size-fits-all approach here, um, but I see, of course, the urgency and the principles that could apply to different areas as well. I think the underlying logic is that we need to assess automated systems in the context of their use. And this is, for example, also not something the AI Act will allow to do. So um, this is a gap that we should be addressing, that we should be addressing on all areas of life where, I, where ADM systems are be becoming applied. So for instance, in the public sector, we are adv um, advocating for the integration um, of all relevant stakeholders, um, and this could be many people, it could be 
people working in the public sector, it could be citizens affected, etc. So I think the underlying principle is we need to consider a context of use and we need to consider within that context all the stakeholders that are kind in any way targeted by the automated systems. What does that mean in practice? Then we have to differentiate uh, because contexts differ and in the workplace, it depends what kind of what kind of system you are looking at. We have worked with work councils in Germany and we have a system of co-determination in Germany. So our idea here was to work with work councils and differentiate the kind of skills um, different actors involved in such a process should have. So work councils, they take decisions. So all members in a work council should be knowledgeable enough to be able to take decisions on any kind of rules relating to automated systems. But there should also be experts, uh, you know, who they could be able to get into the nitty gritty details of these systems. Um, I don't think we need machine learning skills. These people don't need machine learning skills. They need a basic understanding of machine learning, learning logics. And when we talk about the workers, um, not so not work council representatives, but the workers, I don't think we need to speak about machine learning skills at all because they on the ground know what the data they are producing, what they mean, how they should be interpreted and how they should be used by a system. So I don't think they need to be experts in um, fairness metrics and machine learning, but they are experts in what kind of fairness they could support. They know what kind of discrimination in the workplace they would object to on moral grounds. And they also know what kind of productivity measures are accurate maybe. So, um, it's, uh, I don't think you need to have machine learning skills to be able to voice your interest, but you need different levels of skills um, and of people involved. And it also means you need to involve external experts when it comes to deciding what kind of fairness metric is the right choice. And so also we need to think about how to include external machine learning experts to support workers um, in voicing their interests at one point. Thank you, Anna. Actually, before I, I ask Professor Mortati if she has any brief remarks, also for Ravit, would you have, uh, is there anything you want to, to add to what has been said? Um, maybe I'll just echo this last point that was made because I, I hear this question quite often, how can people be a part of co-design if they don't have high level technical skills? And I, I completely agree with what was said that those technical skills are not necessarily what is most needed. Um, and so I just, I wanna highlight this point by maybe raising the opposite question. How can you design an AI system when you don't have that social knowledge to begin with? Why is that not a question that is asked more often, you know? Yes, as a sociologist, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, Marta, anything very briefly you want to add to this? Very briefly, just to mention that I completely agree with the point that Ravid just made. Uh, I totally agree that this is a question that we should be asking much more often than related to the technical skills, while related to the institutionalization process of co-design processes, this is a topic uh, that I work a lot on because I do work a lot with public sector organizations at many different levels. And the, the, the issue there is always, first of all, to try and, understand and explain what is the value that these co-design processes can bring, why we should be embracing them more, and then also to find the appropriate way, and this is often not a one-size-fits-all, as also Dr. Mullen was mentioning, but a very much localized, contextualized intervention that needs to happen. But in our experience of many different projects and many different experimentation, one thing that, we, that I can say is that very often this happens uh, following a, de a, a degree of engagement. So very often the initial step is uh, uh, what we call small scale experimentations where we uh, show uh, an evidence uh, what the process is in small area, maybe with one department uh, of the organization or one service, one policy area, and so on. And then as trust building goes on and as, as evidence is built, we can scale up and the highest level uh, of this would certainly be organizational change where you actually institutionalize the processes and create new processes and new practices in the ways that stakeholders are involved. Thank you very much. I would like now to, uh, there is a, what I think is a very, very interesting uh, question. Uh, 
Um, and I'd like all the panelists uh, to respond if they want, but perhaps first and foremost, uh, uh, the representatives of TUC and Business Europe. And the question is, uh, how much freedom do companies have vis-a-vis uh, -vis AI providers, uh, big tech, if you will, although of course it's not exactly the same, when it comes to implementation? Can employers involve workers in design uh, if I read the question, if their hands are tight, uh, I read that as meaning uh, if it's not companies which are actually developing these products and uh, these services that come from somewhere else. Uh, so I don't know if uh, you, Maxim, or you, and then Ravit, uh, uh -huh. yeah. maybe let, let's start with Ravit and then I will give uh, the floor to TUC and Business Europe. Ravit, please. Okay, uh, here's how I'm understanding this question. Sometimes a company will buy an AI product and, and that's it, and they bought it. It's already, yeah, it's been designed. Um, and I think that is the sense that your hands are tied. But um, there are two points to think about. First of all, sometimes the product will be customized to the company, uh, and the larger the company, uh, the greater leverage they have in that customization process. Second, um, the, the way that the product is going to be embedded in the company is fully in the company's hands. And things such as human oversight or appeal processes are things that are totally within the company's control. So suppose it's a system um, that makes decisions about employees in some way. Will the company implement any measures to explain those decisions to the employees? Will they give employees any ways to appeal those decisions? And when the company decides how to do those processes of explanation and appeal, will they involve the employees in the design processes um, you know, of these options. So I don't think that companies' hands are fully tied ever because they are the ones to decide how the product is going to be integrated in the company. Thank you very much. Ms. Schoeman. Yeah, clearly, I, I think it's a, you know, who is the customer? The customer has to be aware of uh, the uh, added value, but also the risk of the product. And it's up to the customer to uh, implement it or not. But then, if there are risks for others than the customer directly, and of course here we understand employers, and if the risks are bared by the workers, then of course there is here uh, an obligation, and this is uh, an obligation for a safe workplace. So clearly here uh, we, see, we see that the obligation lies there. And second, uh, it's not just information, it's consultation. And at the end of the day, there should be decisions whether or not if the risks uh, are there and there is no means to prevent that risk. Uh, and I think this is potentially linked to another question which I, I would like to reply to. Uh, what do we do when there is no social dialogue? Or there are, at some level, the possibility, if there is a political will, there is the possibility to organize or to relay to an existing social dialogue. If you don't have it at the company level, you have it at the sector level. Should you not have it at the sector level, you have it at the national level. Should you not have it at the national level, you have it at the European level. So don't tell me there is no social dialogue at the workplace, because if you want to have one, or if you want to have the support of one, then you have it. And we can help you to find it, should you not find it now. Thank you very much, Mr. Ceruti. Yeah, so I, perhaps on my side it's to highlight that we cannot do everything at the same time, mm -hmm. but there needs to be a space for everything. And message to the Commission is you will need to make a, a very good case in the legislative debate to come on why there is a need for European legislation on algorithmic management. Um, and on our side, of course, we look at it with a view of also having space for self-regulation by the companies. Um, and of course, we are here in a, in a competitive environment. And I think it was a valid point to say that the companies, they have their trade secrets. They need a certain room for confidentiality because this is what makes them special compared to their competitors. And that needs to be understood by the policymakers. Um, then, when it comes to the role of social partners and what relates to the workers in the process, of course, we need to work together in, in a spirit of cooperation. And we have this basis agreement of 2020. We are looking forward to looking into the practice as it evolves with our trade union colleagues. 
and we'll be drawing together the experience, what it means for us as social partners. We are aware of legislative debates as they are, and we think we need to find the right balance in terms of respecting industrial relations practices in the member states. But we're also aware that there is first the one coming on European Works Councils, and we'll be participating in that uh, to represent the employers we are. Thank you. Thank you, Maxime. And uh, just to be clear, because uh, uh, legislative debate was mentioned, uh, just to be clear at the moment that there is, if you look at the Commission work program, uh, there is no plan to have a legislative initiative on algorithmic management at work. There have been certainly commitments, political commitments, uh, including by my top boss, uh, but as far as the Commission work program is concerned, uh, there is nothing of the sort. Now, I know there are more questions, but unfortunately we need to wrap up the session. I'm, I'm very glad to see this level of interest, uh, but we have five minutes left. So in these five minutes, actually, I think that we will do something slightly different than what we had planned because we don't have a lot of time. So I would like to ask all the panelists, uh, including Anne, who's following us uh, online. I mean, I think we can conclude, I hope we can conclude that, that there is a broad agreement uh, that in principle co-design uh, would be a useful thing. Now, there are many differences of views, uh, I get it, on uh, when to do it, how to do it, uh, who should be involved, uh, and so on and so forth, and that's fair. But imagine for a moment that instead of being a humble policy official of the Commission, I was the genie in the bottle, and I could grant each of you one wish, only one wish, and that would become reality. In order to achieve a good co-design approach, what would be the one thing that you would like to see implemented? Anything, anything. So who wants to start? I use this in internal meetings in my team and in the commission, <laughs> it's always, people always taken a bit aback. I suppose Please. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's straightforward. Uh, it's a business model where participations, and I mean your trade unions, participations, is, uh, is part of the business model and it is what we need to have sustained by uh, regulation. Thank you very much. David. Yeah, I like this point about the business model. Um, and I'm thinking, how can we achieve putting the, the co-design into the business model? It's the accountability structures yep. to the senior management. Accountability structures to make sure that it is a part of the business model. And I think that um, this is a way to enforce accountability that doesn't harm IP because we're not asking about any proprietary information. So I would say mm -hmm. accountability measures to senior leadership. Um, online, what would be your one wish? That we can overcome this narrative that protection of worker interests is countering industry interests or productivity gains. I think we should see it more in coalition than in opposition. And uh, I think this would help us in seeing accountability uh, on many different levels. Thank you, Maxime. Investment. Competitiveness, cooperation, trust. It was one wish, but okay. Yeah, but try, <laughs> I try to do. I try to do what I can. <laughs> Marcia, please. Yeah. To conclude, I think that my wish would be that we all become much better at active listening. So understanding one another and valuing the values of the other, and understanding why those values are valuable also for the others that are in front of us. That that is something that for me would make participation much more effective. And on these wonderful words, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists and thank you for being here as well.